Well, good afternoon and welcome to everybody for today's uh, fourth session in our not-for-profit speaker series. Uh, I'm Matthew Saha, leader of our not-for-profit industry practice for Cherry Beckert, and uh, I welcome everybody back for those who've been with us through the first three sessions and to those maybe joining us for the first time. Uh, I welcome you and uh, great to have you with us this afternoon. I guess, Maddie, we had over 500 people register for this topic uh, today on not-for-profit accounting for contributions and grants, just a refresher really on this core issue, uh, but uh, apparently a lot of demand. So a lot of folks uh, want to hear about this subject. This is probably where we get most of our questions as uh, auditors is how to record this grant or this contribution or, or um, where do I look in the standards. So hopefully this session today will help uh, provide some of that core understanding of the principles on accounting and recognition of contributions and grants and some of the tips and tricks around that as well. So before we get into the content today, and there's a lot of it, so we're going to have to get into it pretty quick, I just want to provide our welcome and our reminders. Again, we will be issuing CPE credit for this, uh, and you need to uh, answer at least three polling questions in order to get CPE credit. Uh, so please take a moment to answer those. There will be five polling questions ultimately, so you'll have more than ample opportunity. If you miss one, uh, don't worry too much about that. You'll have an opportunity to, to answer one or, or two more. Uh, CPE credit, you'll get that within 10 days of the completion of this webinar. We will send that out in uh, an email. If you do not receive it for some reason or it gets stuck somewhere, just uh, reach out to us, cbhlearning at cbh.com. Uh, again, we often ask, uh, will the content be available? Yes, we will post a recorded version of this back on the same website you use to register for the session. So you can look up for that there. Usually that takes about a week for us to clean things up and get it posted out there. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A pod, uh, which is part of the uh, Zoom module, Q&A. You can ask questions there. If you want to chat, there's a chat window. You can chat amongst yourselves. Um, and then just as a reminder, there'll be a short survey that comes out at the end of this, and we'd love for you to fill that out as well. So with all that, let's just get right into the content. And you're stuck with me today, so no speakers to, uh, to introduce. So uh, right into our learning objectives, really uh, the core, like I mentioned, is A, to recognize the key differences between recognizing revenue from uh, voluntary non-exchange transactions. Those would be contributions. Versus other types of transactions, you know, exchange transactions and those sorts of things. We're going to spend quite a bit of time in the beginning going over key terminology to sort of get folks used to some of the lingo that we use when we're talking about recognizing contributions and grants, because some of the lingo can get a little bit confusing sometimes, especially to those people that might be uh, on the board of a not for profit or not on the finance team. You know, often we use all these different words. So I wanted to clear up some of that and just talk, talk the lingo for a little bit. Um, and then obviously we're going to recognize uh, some unique things about un, uh, what is a conditional versus an unconditional promise to give or contribution. There's some distinct accounting around that. Um, and then also we will talk about some, some common, common challenges and complexities. This course is meant to be a fairly basic course. Uh, for those that just need a refresher or maybe are a beginner, uh, there are mo many more advanced topics that are around this area that we may not get to, but we will ask you about your interest in, in us diving deeper in future sessions as well. So we'd love your feedback on that. So with that, let's get right into our first polling question. I'll ask Maddie to just uh, launch this first polling question. We're just trying to get an idea of what is your organization's primary or maybe your largest source of revenue. So the options here, uh, uh, which hopefully should cover most of, of what you receive are contributions, grants, program revenues, that would be usually uh, your exchange type revenues, dues or other kinds of fees, or is it investment income? So give you a couple of minutes to answer that polling question. And uh, if you know me or you've been here before, you know I like a good dad joke or two throughout the presentation. So uh, Maddie, I had a few here jotted down, but I'll just kind of dive in. You know, uh, I like to impersonate uh, certain animals for my kids, makes them laugh. They, they love it, right? But when my, my wife 
finally got really annoyed with my flamingo impersonation, that's when I had to put my foot down. That's thank a good you. one. Thank that's you for a good one. Yeah. Thank you, you for you lending really a along chuckle. With, <laughs> along with Matthew's jokes throughout. <laughs> All right. So that polling question is, uh, I think, uh, completed. Looks like the mo most folks, 36% primary source is uh, uh, either contributions or program revenues. Those are split pretty evenly with about 20% receiving grants and a lesser extent, about 8% being their primary source of investment income. So obviously this subject pretty applicable to most of the folks on the call. So let's talk about first, what is a contribution? So it's really important to first start with the technical definition within the accounting standards codification. So within the ASC master glossary, this is the technical definition of what a contribution is. So a contribution is uh, an unconditional transfer of cash or another asset uh, to an entity, as well as including unconditional promises to give, or a reduction, settlement, or cancellation of its liabilities. So you can either be giving an asset or reducing liabilities in what they like to call a voluntary non-reciprocal transfer by another entity acting other than in an ownership capacity. So I know that's a really kind of uh, technical uh, definition, but the important pieces here is one, that in order to recognize a contribution it needs to be unconditional. And we'll talk more about what that means versus conditional. And then also that it needs to be voluntary and non-reciprocal. In other words, you're not getting anything in return. It's not a two-way uh, sort of uh, transaction. Uh, and if you do get something in return, it's usually pretty nominal or very little value to it. So that is the technical definition that we're building off of what is a contribution. So the other thing that's described within the accounting standards uh, is that uh, contributions are distinguished from other sorts of common revenue that not-for-profits might get because of those unique characteristics that are defined in the definition that we just looked at, right? Because it is unconditional, because it is voluntary and non-reciprocal, it distinguishes a contribution from other sorts of revenue. And the other types of revenue that are more uh, uh, common as well and described within the standards would be, of course, exchange transactions. That's where you have reciprocal transfers in which each party receives more or less commensurate value uh, in what they're exchanging. Uh, you've got investments by owners and distributions to owners. So this will happen when there's two associated entities that will uh, sometimes transfer money in more of an ownership capacity, or you've got other non-reciprocal transfers. And these are things like when uh, an entity is imposing a, a tax on another entity or a judgment or a fine that uh, something you didn't, uh, you didn't want to have to pay, but you have to pay, uh, but they're not voluntary, obviously. So that's why contributions are unique and why there's so much uh, guidance around how do we deal with the accounting for contributions. So uh, that uh, is just kind of our primer going into this. Another type of very common uh, transaction that we see not-for-profits get into are what we call agency transactions. So we often toss around this term, oh, that's an agency transaction, or that's a pass-through uh, fund. So oftentimes, not-for-profits will act in this capacity as either being a, an agent, a trustee, or some sort of other intermediary between two other parties. And maybe those other parties are really acting as the donor and donee for the transaction. So in this case, you, the not-for-profit organization is just basically a go-between. It's passing through monies, uh, passing through cash sometimes, sometimes it's passing through gifts and kinds, you know, supplies or other things that are sort of passing through the organizations. So in these sorts of situations, uh, we don't recognize revenue and expenses related to those types of transactions. Instead, we're typically recording those things through balance sheet entries only, uh, recording a, a, a revenue or a, a asset and an obligation when the funds flow through us and de-recognizing that asset and obligation when uh, the money is passed through to the to the organization. 
So the AICPA uh, accounting guide, the ANA guide, which uh, if you don't have access to, you really should. It's, it's pretty much the best guide that's out there as far as all things accounting and auditing related to not-for-profits. It has a chapter on contributions. And within that, they provide you know, a lot of different types of, of flow charts. But just, this is just kind of one of the more handy flow charts that just helps walk through whether or not a transfer from one entity to another includes a contribution or not. So again, you can kind of walk through this uh, typical um, thought process that would you, you, you would go through. But the first question really is, does the, the organization, does the not-for-profit have the discretion to choose the beneficiaries of the transferred resources? And if the answer to that question is generally no, we really can't choose who it goes to. This is just kind of, we're taking it in, we're giving it out, but we don't have really any power over it then you're, you're obviously acting in that agency type capacity. So it would not be a transaction that we would consider to include a contribution. If the answer to this is yes, we do have uh, power to choose the ultimate beneficiaries, then the next question would be, do you uh, provide anything of value back to the resource provider? Well, if, if the answer to that is clearly no, then squarely we have a contribution, right? You're getting resources in, you ultimately can decide who the beneficiary is and uh, you're not giving anything in return. That's squarely a contribution. However, if there is some value provided, then we continue down the flow of the track here. And the next question would be, is the value of what you're providing as the nonprofit uh, sort of nominal in value? And, and the, the situation or example I think of here is my dad is a big fan of PBS. He loves to watch PBS. And, you know, every year PBS does a fun drive and they, they have the certain different giving levels and everything. But, you know, they're always at the maybe at the two hundred dollar level. You're going to get that box set DVD of Downton Abbey or uh, whatever the, the popular show is. Well, you know, that is probably one of those things where you're, you're providing a contribution on a certain level. But what you're what the not for profit is giving up as far as the resource it's providing back is fairly nominal in value so that if that's the situation. And we have that situation where we have, we have give little giveaways and stuff. Then obviously that contribute that transaction is still a contribution transaction, but we would take the value of what we're providing, whatever PBS paid to either produce or uh, create the the DVD box set, whatever their cost is, they would simply expense that part of the the transaction. All right. So if it's not nominal, if you're giving up uh, more commensurate value. Um, then obviously the next question is, is the value provided by the resource provider uh, commensurate to the value received by the not-for-profit? So are we giving, are we taking in and giving up equal value? The answer to that is yes. Obviously now we're in exchange transaction territory. That would be where we would consult, you know, uh, ASC 606 or contracts with customers to evaluate those types of transactions. The answer is no. Um, then typically you get into this area where you have sort of split transactions where maybe um, maybe the, there's some value uh, that you're giving back to the organization that's more than nominal, but it's, it's clearly not equal. It's, it's not uh, commensurate with one another. So in those types of transactions, uh, you would have an exchange portion of the transaction. And typically you would do that at fair value. So whatever the the fair value that, that those services would be provided at if you do charge separately for them. And then any excess would be a contribution revenue. So you can have the concept within a gap that something can be purely contribution, something can be purely exchange transaction, or it can have elements of both. And uh, you really need to split them up. Okay, so with that, let's talk terminology. And I like to spend a, a good bit of time here just because, again, some a lot of folks get really caught up in all the different terms that we, we use in, uh, in this field. So let's talk about that. So contribution, we already talked about the technical definition of contribution. So obviously, it's a common term within the FASB codification, which is our Bible for GAP, basically. Um, but it's just good to remind you, you know, that this could in, contributions can include resources from all sorts of different uh, providers. So individuals, uh, foundations, you know, 
corporations or companies, even the government can provide contributions uh, as well. So they, they come from a lot of different sources. So what about the term grant? So sometimes you get, what's a, what's a grant? How is a grant different than a contribution? A lot of organizations budget for them separately. They sort of show them separately, but ultimately, what's the difference between a contribution and a grant? So I like to think of you know, a, a, a grant as just a typically, typically, because there are exceptions, it's just a, a, a form of a contribution. So it, it follows the same accounting guidelines. We're in the same section of the codification, but typically a grant is a, a form of a contribution that really, it gets a little bit more formal. Usually sometimes you have to apply for them. Usually there's a formal grant agreement. Um, and likely with grants, there's gonna be you know, more specific uh, restrictions. A lot of times when, when organizations are granting funds to another organization, they are for a very specific reason or purpose. So typically those grant agreements would likely have some, some restrictions. They might even have some conditions that need to be met uh, before that you, you have the right to receive those uh, funds or potentially having to return them. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. In rare circumstances, there could be grants that are exchange transactions. This can occur. Um, for example, you know, there might be an organization that grants money to a not-for-profit to do certain uh, research and development that could result in, for example, patents or intellectual property that are specifically retained by that resource provider. In other words, uh, they're getting all the benefits of the research and, and are able to monetize the results of the research uh, in a way that gives them more commensurate value. And that grant would be an exchange transaction. But like I said, that's typically more rare. Uh, a lot of times grants are done just for the pure educational purposes or for specific purposes to enhance a not-for-profit's mission or a core you know, cause within the community. So then let's talk about this, this term we like to use, promise to give. So promise to give um, is, is really, and we use all sorts of terms for this. Sometimes we call it promise to give. Sometimes we label this as a contribution receivable. Those two terms are really interchangeable one with one another. Um, some folks will even call this a pledge, uh, a pledge receivable. Um, the, I will just note that the AICPA and the guides kind of um, uh, encourage folks not to refer to promises to give or contributions receivable as pledges receivable because they oftentimes um, think that a, a pledge a pledge to give could be construed as an intent to give, not a promise to give. So that word pledge, even though we use it all the time, we might have to fill out a pledge card or a pledge agreement. Um, we try not to use that word in the technical area of GAAP uh, too often, but we still see it out there on financial statements and um, I don't think it's going away anytime soon. So the, the term promise to give is really when we have an oral or uh, written or oral agreement to contribute cash or other assets to another entity. So um, these types of promises should carry you know, rights and obligations. So the not-for-profit organization really, once that promise is made, has a right to receive uh, those, those promised funds in the future. And that individual, that foundation, that corporation has an obligation uh, to commit. And a, a lot of times through state laws, you know, these are legally enforceable uh, type promises as well. Uh, so typically a promise to give, this is where um, a lot of folks that work in the private company world have a hard time understanding general not-for-profit gap because they go, oh man, you can book revenue just based on a promise. And uh, we have to explain, yes, we can do that in not-for-profit accounting. People can make promises. And as long as we get it documented, uh, we can book that revenue as soon as the promise is made. So that's what a promise to give is. Somebody just asked, what's the difference between a promise and an intent? And we will get there on uh, the next uh, page. So a donor restriction, that's another important concept. So a donor restriction is basically a donor stipulation that specifies the use of a contribution that's more specific than the broad limits that might result from the nature of the organization itself, the, oper the, the, the environment in which it operates or its purpose or mission. So just think of it as, hey, the, 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 
donor is stipulated this to be something more specific than the general mission of the organization. They want it, they want it to be a little bit more specific than just your general purpose. So if you're an organization that does uh, research, research on uh, you know, cancer, the donor may say, hey, I don't just want this generally to research cancer, I want this to research um, you know, specifically lung cancer or something like that. So it's, it's more specific than your general, uh, general uh, purpose or mission. So what about conditional contribution? I've mentioned that already, um, but a conditional contribution, which we will go into in a little bit more detail is basically a contribution or a promise to give that is conditional because it contains one or more barriers and also that, that must be overcome. And it also has either a right of return or a right of release of funds. I'm sure you have tons of questions. What does all that mean? We will go over it. All right, some other key terms in here as well. Uh, gifts in kind. Gifts in kind is a term that we broadly uh, use to refer to all non-cash gifts. Could be personal property, furniture, equipment, pharmaceuticals, supplies. Uh, could also be the use of long-lived assets. So those folks that have $1 leases um, uh, to use buildings and that kind of stuff, that's a gift in kind. Could include collections of art. So all these things, it's just kind of a term we use um, to describe non-cash gifts. There's also contributed services. So contributed services generally include uh, services that could be provided by volunteers, individuals with specified skills, or even affiliated organizations. So when we get into contributed services, which we will, depending on the nature and who's providing the services and the facts and circumstances around that, that will drive whether or not you recognize those and how you recognize them. Uh, so contributed services are, are, are unique in themselves as well. Uh, then we also you know, hear this term, contributed non-financial assets. So this is a term that we like to use as well. It's mentioned in the codification several times. And it's really just a broad way to describe both gifts and kinds and contributed services. So when we think of contributed non-financial assets, uh, it's all inclusive of gifts and kinds, contributed services. And these particular types of gifts are subject to certain presentation and disclosure requirements that we'll talk about today as well. Finally, intentions to give. So somebody asked, what's the difference between an intention to give and a promise to give? So intentions to give are different because they're generally revocable or subject to modification in the future. So examples would be, hey, we just heard so-and-so provide named us in their will, and they're going to give us a house, or they're going to give us $100,000, right? Wills can be changed. Revocable trusts can be changed in the person's lifetime. So while that's an intention that that person intends to give to you, it is different than a promise to give because it doesn't have the same sort of rights and obligations as a promise. So there is a difference there. And it's, it's, that's when it becomes very important too how we word things in communications with donors or how we word things on pledge forms and cards. We wanna make sure that we arrive at a promise and not an intent. Uh, so it's another important item. And then finally, uh, contributed collections. So contributed collections, we also we often hear about these. These are works of arts, historic treasures, similar items that, that meet the definition of a collection. We'll go over that. And then the recognition just varies depending on your capitalization policy. So recognition of contributed collections can uh, vary uh, uh, quite a bit. All right, uh, we've got other polling questions coming up. So don't worry about those, they're gonna come soon. Let's just start to get into, into recognition. So general principles here. Accounting for contributions depends on whether the transfer of assets, including promises to give, is received by the not-for-profit with either donor-imposed conditions, donor-imposed restrictions, or both. So we'll talk about uh, uh, conditions in a little bit, but uh, donor-imposed restrictions, we already gave you the definition there. So unconditional, when something's unconditional, including unconditional promises to give, we basically recognize those revenues in the period that it's received. So this is what shocks some people, that, especially with promises to give, that you can book that based off of promises. But either, you know, we're typically either recognizing an asset, and, and these are, for example, but could include other things, you know, obviously cash, securities, if, if people gave appreciated securities, 
a contribution receivable in the case of a promise to give or some sort of other uh, asset or gift in kind account. The other option is, you know, you decrease the liability. Sometimes that happens where somebody gives by forgiving, uh, essentially. So you're reducing accounts payable or a note payable or something like that. And finally, the last way would be, you know, to be by recording an expense. And that's typically the case when somebody's donating services to you, right? That actually uh, helped you out and is an expense on your books that was offset by the fact that they uh, gave it to you. Um, so it's an offset. So you'll notice that all of those entries in the period received are the debit side of the journal entry for the accountants in the room. So what's the credit side of the journal entry? Well, obviously it's contribution revenue. So that's, that's how we're gonna book the accounts. Need to talk a little bit more about unconditional promises to give because they're so unique and there's some key considerations in how, how and when we can recognize them and then how they're treated based on uh, how far out into the future some of those promises go. So generally, these are the key considerations that you need to be aware of. Um, obviously, to recognize unconditional promises to give, this is where the auditors uh, get involved. There needs to be sufficient evidence. So verifiable documentation that the promise was made. Typically, there's either written agreements, there's a pledge card. If it was an oral promise, if it was just Mr. Smith on the phone told me he was good for a million. Um, obviously we want some sort of evidence of that, either some sort of log or the call or a recording or some other means that we can verify or maybe you followed up with him by email later just to say, I wanna make sure I heard you well, you said a million bucks. Um, yeah, we wanna see some sort of uh, verification. Unconditional promises to give also subject to obviously management's determination of any allowance for uncollectible accounts. So obviously once you book those items, you need to immediately start annually thinking about um, whether your people are gonna make good on those collections. Obviously donors situations change sometimes um, and we need to evaluate whether uh, we think we're gonna collect. Also unconditional promises to give in the future. So they might say, hey, I'd like to give a million dollars, by the way, I'm gonna pay it 200, 1,000 over the next five years. Uh, those need to be uh, A, recorded as a uh, donor restricted gift and also uh, subject to a present value uh, discount uh, as well. So typically there's an inherent time restriction when you book something now, but aren't gonna get it in the future. And then also there's uh, subject to, to present value calculations using appropriate discount rates. One of the options for promises to give is you can select a fair value option for promises to give. We would note that most, most not-for-profits do not make that uh, option to select, but there is a fair value option as well. All right, next polling question, because I know people are always anxious for that. So this is a question to test your knowledge. So donor imposed restrictions on contributions or grants will impact the timing of revenue recognition. What do we think? Do we think that is a yes? Restrictions impact timing, is it a no? Or if you're not sure, it's fine to say you're not sure. And uh, while she's doing that, you know, uh, Manny, what is, uh, do you know what the least spoken language in the world is? Hmm, least spoken language, I do not. It's actually sign language. Because <laughs> it's, it's done through signs, okay. Good job, good job. That's a corny one. Yeah, so we'll give people a few more seconds on that. Um, any, let's see if there's any questions I can answer really quick here. Now for profits that sell branded merchandise, contributions, exchange transactions, UBI. I don't know, but I'm not a tax person, so I won't, won't speak to that. But I think uh, some of that stuff is, uh, is exempt. But if you're doing it with a profit motive, Obviously, that's going to be an exchange transaction. Uh, if you're selling it at cost or, or below cost, uh, there might be a contribution component I could, I could see there. Uh, polling question number two, yes, it does impact timing. No, it doesn't. 40% and 6% uh, are, are not sure. So I'm doing a terrible job so far. So donor-imposed restrictions will not impact the timing of revenue recognition, right? Um, so a donor-imposed Restriction is just, uh, again, the definition, it would be a stipulation by the donor that's more specific than the general mission of the organization. So while it, while it 
determines how you record it with or without donor restriction. It doesn't impact the timing of uh, when you record it. That it will be very much different when we talk about conditional contributions. So if I haven't confused you enough yet, wait until we get to those slides. So with that, um, let's just go through some donor restriction examples really quickly. So uh, these would be uh, just situations where you have uh, contributions and we're just answering, is this with or without donor restriction? So obviously your individual sends a check-in for $3,000 to support the organization's mission to reduce homelessness. So if it's just general for the mission, obviously unrestricted contribution, not restricted. A foundation awards a grant for $25,000 for a new software system. So it doesn't mention the mission of the organization. I assume the software system is something very specific that they either need or the, they've asked for or the donor knows about. So in that case, yes, that would be restricted for that specific purpose. An individual makes an unconditional promise to give to support uh, the general mission of an organization for $100,000 to be paid out over four year period, $25,000 each. So is this donor restricted? We have uh, to support the general mission. Well, yes, it is because uh, you're gonna have an inherent time restriction there that will uh, be relieved when you receive the cash. So even though you record the entire $100,000 as revenue and a promise to give or contribution receivable, it's gonna be donor restricted until you get the cash in and are able to expend the money. All right, individual contributes $50,000 to an endowment for scholarship programs. That would obviously be uh, donor restricted um, to support endowments. And then finally, a not-for-profit receives a bequest from a donor's estate that was made to satisfy the provisions of their last will and testament. So in this case, they've received the, the, the bequest. They're not just aware of it. If the donor didn't, if there was nothing more specific in the will, I would say that is not restricted. Use that for any purpose you see fit. So those are some donor restriction examples that we have in there. Um, before we go on, Manny, any burning questions? Because there's only so many screens I can uh, monitor right now. Sure, I did see one. If a vendor forgives the liability as a contribution, does that get recorded as an inked contribution or cash? Or does it make a difference? Well, that would be, I think that would be an in-kind contribution because especially if um, the vendor has, maybe they've sent an invoice already, but you haven't paid it and they just said, hey, uh, don't worry about it, then uh, definitely an in-kind uh, contribution uh, there. If you've already paid it and they send the cash back, then I think it's a question of, uh, you know, were the two things, if they were directly related and it just happened that you paid it already and they refunded you the cash, I think um, in that case, I would uh, I would still consider that an in-kind contribution and sort of the cash is just sort of wiping each other out um, going back and forth. So good okay. question. Sounds good. I think we are good to move right now, uh, but feel free to keep putting questions in the Q&A. All right, perfect. So uh, let's talk about gifts and kind and uh, contributed services and some of the recognition issues there. So gifts in kind, again, um, typically uh, that would include all of our sort of our non-cash things. So, uh, you know, basically if a gift in kind can be either used by the not-for-profit or maybe sold and monetized, then uh, the, the recognition is to uh, record the value of the gift in kind at its, its fair market value or the best value you can you can come up with. Um, the the not-for-profit has to have, you know, discretion over either further distributing those gifts in kind or the ability to sell them. So the one, the one area you get into is if you don't have sort of those risks and rewards of the ownership of the gifts in kind, um, which is typically and most common having physical possession of those items, then it could call into fact, you know, we're back to sort of that agency or pass through transaction relationship. So you have to have the risk and rewards of ownership. You have to have the discretion to either be able to use it or sell it. Uh, and in that case, you recognize it. If you don't have those, then again, this becomes an agency transaction where you're just really playing an intermediary and you shouldn't record any revenue or expense. You should simply record that as uh, pass through 
through the statement of financial position. On contributed services, really the answer in accounting is it depends. So there's different types of contributed services. The main type of consideration, and the gap hasn't changed on this for, for some time, is whether or not um, the service either created or enhanced a non-financial asset. So think about uh, a contractor uh, giving their time or somebody giving their, their time to fix uh, something physical uh, within your plant or something like that, creating or enhancing a non-financial asset. Or you have situations where the service requires specialized skills. These are just examples, could be accountants, architects, doctors, lawyers, nurses, plumbers, whatever. These people all have specialized skills. And if you didn't use these folks, if they didn't contribute those services, you would have had to otherwise pay somebody with those specialized skills to do the service. So if those, if either one of those conditions are met, then we can recognize the value of those contributed services. And we typically recognize it at, at fair market value. A lot of times the best way to get that is to, to ask the folks, hey, thank you very much for contributing your services. What would you have typically charged for these services at you know, market values? And, and certainly that's a good indicator of what the fair market value is. There's also a different category of contributed uh, services, and that's when you receive them from an affiliate organization. So this could be a you know, parent-child relationship or a sister organization or something. A lot of times these are often done in sort of shared service arrangements between a group of affiliated uh, not-for-profit entities. So in these sort of situations, uh, when you have, you're, you're basically recognizing all the services received from the personnel of that affiliate that benefit your not-for-profit, similar to the way you'd recognize them as if they were on your own payroll. So obviously, if you are able to obtain you know, the cost of those people's hours, their time and salary, uh, you would recognize that at the cost of the affiliate that's providing the services, uh, if you're unable to get that information for some reason, they don't provide it or you can't get it, then obviously you would, you would try to go back to fair value again. So what would you have had to pay someone with a similar skill set for the time uh, that they spent? Obviously, this is when you have arrangements where they're contributing their time. So people, people often ask the question, well, what if we're paying the affiliate for the services? Well, then that's not a contribution. That's uh, an exchange transaction. You're paying them for the services you're receiving. So uh, this is the accounting sort of when you have uh, services that you get from affiliate organizations. Uh, you also disclose this information in the footnotes of the financials too. So you should always need to disclose these uh, affiliate uh, relationships as well. And then that, that really leaves the last category, which is often asked, like, what about our community volunteers? What about the folks that show up in the masses to help run some of our events? Or what about all of our board members who contribute hours of their time each month, um, kind of giving their insights, their expertise. Um, so the, the general answer for that is for those folks, those volunteer type people, community or board members, generally we would not recognize those contributed services, right? Um, unless they meet one of the criteria in the last two slides. So again, create or enhance a non-financial asset or require services that you would otherwise have to pay for, um, then typically you would not record the value of those services. Many organizations choose to track this information of volunteers and to disclose it in their financial statements so that they can give you know, the users an idea of how many uh, community volunteers are providing services. But typically we don't tack a value onto it and record it in the financial statements. All right. Uh, any any questions that are on point around these items, uh, Maddie, that you want to interject yes, with? I, I did see. Uh, can you use other contribution instead of in kind contribution for the liability forgiveness? Can you use other contribution instead of in kind contribution for liability forgiveness? Uh, it's in terms of what uh, what line item it shows up on, I think that you'd want to. I think you'd want to show it as in kind 
um, in that case because you're you're receiving something you're, you're basically getting a non-cash uh, value. I think you'd want that to show up in your kind contributions. Okay, we did have a couple more relating to the topic. Uh, how would this one be recorded a not-for-profit purchases an item and then gives it away as a gift in kind? I think you did touch on this a little. Yeah, I, I guess in that in that case, you're giving it away. So it's like, I'm not sure why they're giving it away, but, but obviously it's a cost to you. It's an expense to you. And then typically if, you know, if you're giving it away, I assume you're giving it away to solicit a contribution. So really it's just the difference between the value of what you're giving away and what you received is the contribution portion. The other part is, is the expense. Okay, great. And then last one, uh, if the nonprofit is modified cash basis, would they disclose the donated services? Yeah, so typically when you're modified cash basis, you know, you're gonna disclose what differences that you have. And then uh, if it's not, uh, a recorded item on the face of the financial statements, there would be no reason to have the disclosure uh, items there. So I'm going to say if you're modified cash, uh, you're already disclosing that you're non-GAAP, so you wouldn't have to have disclosure items for things that don't show up on the face of the financial statements. Okay, great. Thanks, Matthew. You bet. All right. I know we got a lot more content to get through, uh, but we will just cruise right along. So contributed non-financial assets, I mentioned this uh, briefly, but these uh, have special disclosure requirements and presentation requirements. So it's important to note contributed non-financial assets uh, have to be separated on a line item of their own on your statement of activities. Also important to note that um, there's certain information that the FASB wants to see in the footnote disclosure. Uh, for example, if there was any donor imposed restrictions on those non-financial contributions, uh, what valuation techniques you use to arrive at the fair value, and your policy, whether you uh, typically monetize those, whether you sell those contributed non-financial assets, or whether you use them in your program or mission. So a little bit additional information, you have to do that. That's a new standard that came out uh, not too long ago. Uh, Going to skip ahead now to collections and works of art, because those are often something we get asked about. How do we record those? So the definition of collections is, is uh, very specific in our world, in not-for-profit world. So it has to include all of these items. So a collection, a work of art, has to be something that's held for public uh, exhibition, uh, education, or research, rather than financial gain. You're not holding it to, to make money. They're protected, encumbered, cared for, preserved. And they meet, uh, they're subject to an organizational policy that if you were to sell any of those works of collections, you either have to use them to acquire more collections or to uh, provide in the direct care of your existing collections or both of those. So that's the definition. If something meets that definition of a collection, then there's really three alternatives to recognizing those. Um, and not-for-profits get to choose this. So it's one of the rare uh, opportunities where we get to choose. So you can either capitalize all collection items, and those would be you know, items of collections that are either uh, purchased or contributed. You can capitalize all collection items on a prospective basis. So basically you draw a line in the sand at a point of time and say from this point forward, we're gonna recognize everything after this date. Or the most common would be you can choose to not recognize items that meet the definition of collection. This is what most not-for-profits use because it's more simple in terms of administration, in terms of determining of fair values and tracking and recognizing all those types of uh, items in the collection. So if it is capitalized, you have to go to fair value, of course. If it's not capitalized, then you don't have to worry about fair value. You can just uh, you know, track those items, and I'm sure you would want to for insurance purposes and, and, and all of that. So certainly uh, unique recognition principles when it comes to collections. That brings us to the third polling question. We'll get this out there real quick for people. Do donor-imposed conditions on contributions or grants Will those impact the timing of revenue recognition? Well, based on the last polling question, and I think I might have given a big hint uh, to this one, we'll see what people think. 
Uh, giving people 30 seconds or so. So Maddie, uh, did you hear about this restaurant that NASA is gonna put on the moon? You hear about mm. the news? I did not, but I, I do love anything space related. Let's hear. Yeah, so it's supposed to, it's supposed to have phenomenal food, uh, but no atmosphere. <laughs> no atmosphere. But um, but um, all right. Let's get that polling question wrapped up so that we can get uh, through to our last two polling questions. But um, we got so much content. I don't know that I'm going to get to all the Q and A. I see a lot of different questions coming in, but we'll uh, we'll get to as much as as we can. Yes, we collect all of the questions, so we can always follow up later. Don't worry, we have everything you are submitting. Perfect. Well, this is a big subject we want to definitely top on. What so? Which what, what is? And and by the way, the majority of the answers were yes, sixty percent. Uh, so those folks were correct. So conditions do impact the timing of recognition of uh, contribution. So what's a conditional contribution? So contribution or promise to, to give that is conditional. Uh, it's conditional, but it has both of these following characteristics. So again, either one or more barrier that must be overcome in order to be uh, entitled to those assets being transferred. And as well, it has to have either a right of return to the contributor, in other words, potential to give the money back, or a right of release of the promissor, in other words, some sort of reimbursement arrangement or use something you need to do before you're entitled to get the cash from the grantor. So that, those are the definitions uh, of a conditional contribution. What is a barrier, you may ask? Well, a barrier could include a, a number of things. So the FASB designed, defined a barrier as either a measurable performance barrier. That would be something that is you know, completely measurable. You have to serve X number of uh, patients. You have to obtain some certain level of output, number of units, specific outcome, those types of things. Then you have this category that's called limited discretion by the recipient on the conduct of the activity. This essentially encumbers uh, all the types of uh, different uh, governmental grants that organizations typically get that come along with the stipulations that you have to follow you know, federal regulations on the administration of those grants. So when you get federal money, typically those funds are subject to what we in the business call uniform grant guidance. Those guidelines and that guidance is going to limit your discretion on how you conduct the grant activity because it's going to subject you to certain time frame limitations that you have to adhere to. It's going to subject you to certain cost uh, allowances for allowable expenses. It might even restrict or tell you who you need to hire to, um, to execute the activity. So in those cases, you have this barrier to overcome in that you have to conduct things in accordance with their guidelines. Finally, you've got stipulations that are related to the purpose of the agreement. This would be things like, you know, when the grant, you get a grant and it's, uh, it's for research and it re requires some sort of report that summarizes the findings of your research uh, that you need to provide. Obviously, that's a, getting that report is a stipulation and purpose of why they gave you the grant funds. So that's a barrier you need to overcome by providing that, uh, that, that report. So again, uh, there's lots of examples of these. These sort of things can get a little bit tricky, but essentially what happens here is when you have one or more of these barriers, that is also, again, coupled with either a right of return of the assets, you have to give them back, or a right of release, you have to get it reimbursed, you have to overcome these barriers before you can recognize contribution revenue. So a lot of times in here, you know, things pretty simple, for example, a measurable performance barrier, is it, it, until you've hit that measurable performance barrier, you haven't recorded the revenue. The next question will be, well, they gave us the cash already. We gave us the cash up front for this grant. Well, that may be the case, but if it's coupled with a right of return, in other words, you don't hit those measurable performance items and you potentially have to give the grant back, then you're going to have a deferred revenue, a deferred contribution revenue until you hit those measurable performance related barriers. So you can begin to understand that there's some complexities here. Again, this is a beginner course, so we're not going to get into the weeds. But there's 
there's some complexities here about having barriers and overcoming them in order to affect the timing of when you recognize that revenue. Now we could go through a million examples, but we don't have time to today because we're almost at the end of our time already. So what we're gonna do instead is skip ahead to our fourth polling question so that I can make sure that you guys can get this in. So launch that polling question, would you be interested in future speaker series that dive deeper into examples of the technical accounting issues around contributions and grants? So maybe one, deeper on conditional contributions where we could go into uh, more examples and the debits and the credits. If that's something that interests you, uh, let us know yes or no on that. While people have a chance to answer that, I guess my last question to you, Maddie, would be, why do you never see elephants hiding in trees? Hmm. I have no idea. It's because they're so good at it. We never see, they're professionals. They're they so good, you can never, you can't even catch them. So again, <laughs> we'll let people fill in the last, uh, the fourth polling question here. While we do that, I'm just going to mention uh, just uh, a handy chart that is in, um, this is something the FASB created when they came out with the latest uh, updates to conditional contributions. I'm not going to go over this, but I want it to be in the content so that when you replay this, you can pause this or you can take a screenshot of this. Um, but if you also Googled accounting standards update or ASU 2018-08 and went to a PDF, you would find this nice decision-making uh, diagram in there as well. So this really helps kind of break down, again, sort of the flow of how we decide um, what what area of the codification we go to to recognize revenue. And the important thing here too is you'll notice you work through the issue of whether or not something is conditional or not before you even think about whether it's restricted or not. So the order of things is, is it a contribution? And if it is, yes. Is it conditional? Yes or no. Then you get up here so that till it becomes unconditional, then we're recognizing it. And then you consider whether there's any restrictions back or forth. So again, don't have time to go through this in detail. Oh, look at that. About 85% of folks said, yes, you want more, <laughs> want more training on this. I guess we got our work cut out for us. So this is a good slide to, um, to come back to that will show kind of a flow and diagram of how this works. And then lastly, I would just say, hey, you know, pause. I'll let you pause on this too in the recorded version. Um, but this is just, uh, again, kind of as we're discussing about contributions, just the importance of a good gift acceptance policy too, which is a written gift and acceptance policy that really considers all the types of assets you're willing to take versus not willing to take and considering the administrative burdens, considering the staff, time, the board, the donor's perspective on things, you know, and thinking through things like the cost of holding um, some contributed non-financial assets, some of the risks involved. Think about the definition of an IRS uh, non-standard gift as well. And then where you post that policy, how do you get that information out to, to potential donors as far as what you're willing to accept? So that's some more information. Sorry, we didn't have time to, to dive through all of that um, today. And I know we're five minutes, we're, Mary, what, we're five minutes over. I'm gonna let you pause or launch that last final fifth polling question just to get people another chance. Um, and maybe there's something I said in here that makes you say, man, I need a consult here. I need, to, <laughs> I've got issues. Um, let us know if we can reach out to you about this or any ish, other issues. This is just basically a polling question prompt to um, get some follow-up action from somebody at Cherry Becker to reach out to you and uh, set up a conversation. So if you need that, certainly press yes. Uh, if, if it's a maybe, that's great. If no, that's also great too, no problem. So uh, appreciate everybody's time today. We'll give a few more uh, seconds to answer that. I know I probably didn't get there. I mean, I know a lot of people have very specific examples of how do I record this or not. And, and I love this last uh, uh, note here is we don't get enough training and contributions. I agree with you. I agree. We need to have more. So this one was a long time. I've been wanting to develop this for, for a number of years and finally was able to um, put together what I would consider this basic overview, but certainly more 
uh, to come out and follow. Um, so with that, I'm gonna close out that polling question. And um, I just wanna thank Maddie for all her help and also thank you for coming with us today. We hope to see you on the next uh, Not-for-Profit Speaker Series of 2023. So thank you, have a great day.